In ancient Mesopotamia, in the Fertile Crescent region, around what's now Iraq, you had large-scale agricultural societies forming. They were centralized societies. There were religious and political authorities who helped organize those societies. And they got so big that folks couldn't really keep track of everyday exchanges anymore. What they started to do was um, not introduce money. They didn't start printing coins, or minting coins, or printing bills or anything. What they started to do was they started to keep track of things on little cuneiform tablets, little clay tablets, where they wrote in cuneiform script receipts, basically saying, um, on this day, Don Patterson gave to Bill Maurer 70 bushels of barley, and in return, Bill Maurer gave Don Patterson um, a whole bunch of goats or something like that. They started to keep track of, of transactions on these little receipts. Um, and the problem is, if you just put yourself in this kind of a world for a minute, an agricultural world, a world of barley and goats and grain and that kind of a thing, um, crops and animals mature at different rates. So the chances um, that I would have the goats the same day that Don is gonna have the barley are pretty slim. What we do in this is we'd make a kind of contract. We'd say, I'm gonna give Don 50 bushels of barley right now today, and in eight months, he's gonna give me six goats. Okay? It's kind of a promissory note, right? It's a contract. We don't have money happening. Instead, we have these little contracts sealing us in time and sealing our relationship, an economic relationship that endures over a period of months. Now, there's a problem with this, which you might have already guessed, which is, first of all, this is a clay tablet. What if it breaks or gets lost? Well, they solve that problem by storing these all in centralized storehouses, storing them in temples, storing them under the authority of religious figures who presumably are gonna have enough power in the society that people aren't gonna mess with the storehouse and mess with the records. That's the, how they solve the first problem of, you know, what if they get broken or lost? There's another problem. This is clay, and I should say this is actually a replica. Um, I'm not handling an ancient artifact here, but a replica of one. This is clay. Um, if I don't fire it, if I don't bake it, well, what I can do is lick my thumb, rub it out, and change it, and suddenly change. You know, oh, really? I'm gonna give Don only five goats in 18 months, not eight like it says here. Right, so there's the potential for forgery here. Well, what they did, um, to mitigate that potential for forgery or fraud is they would write all the same information that's on this tablet again on a bigger tablet and they'd stick this tablet inside, stick it inside, close the whole thing up so that you've got a double record of the transaction. So, um, and then this thing sits in the storehouse. So let's say I do try to forge this in six months or whatever we'd agreed upon, we get together again to settle this transaction. I give my five goats. Don says, hey, wait a minute, you were supposed to give me eight goats. Um, and I say, but look, look, it only says five here. Well, then in the presence of temple authorities, we can crack this thing open and see what the original says and compare it against what's on the outside, on the envelope, these things are called, right? You've got basically a sort of duplication of all the transactional information here, again, here, as a means of making sure that everyone is being fair, making sure that there's no fraud. So what I like to say um, is that in the beginning wasn't barter, in the beginning was the receipt, right? In the beginning were these records um, of transactions. And it's from this that we start to get the idea of money as a means of accounting for things. Now, you might say, but you know, I can go to any museum bill and see ancient coins. Where did those coins come from? Surely, you know, there's a part of the history of money um, that you're missing here, which is why did people start minting coins and then issuing bills and banknotes? Well, imagine that you're the temple authorities and you're helping to maintain this whole system of recording transactions and trades. 
you're also a storehouse. You are sitting on a lot of materials of wealth that people are bringing, bringing into you as tribute, right? In, in deference to your authority and um, in the honor of the gods and so forth. You're also exacting payment from people for the services that you're rendering. Well, one of the things that some of the, the storehouses in Mesopotamia and in the ancient world started to do was say, you know, what we really need is to formalize that system. We need to formalize a system by which we're getting compensated for some of the services that we're providing. Um, you start to get institutions that look an awful lot like states, organized political units. States that are providing services for people and then start expecting people to pay a fee, people to pay taxes um, for those services. Now, taxes are great if you're a state because they provide you the money that you need to function. They're also great if you're a state because they're another way for you to secure political control over the population. And a key, key thing in the history of, of the origin of money is the use of tax um, to consolidate political authority. Essentially, I can say, if I'm the ruler, you are my subjects. You're going to pay a tax every year. In return, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to defend us against our enemies. I'm going to make sure that if there's a famine, I'll get food to you and so on. Um, but in return, you're going to pay me tax, and you're going to pay me tax in my token. So what states start to do is start minting tokens using metal, generally silver, also bronze, also gold. Mint tokens and set them out there in the world and say, you've got to pay tax, at least in part, in the token that I have given you. Well, this creates a market in those tokens. Everybody has to get a hold of those things, right, in order to, to pay their tax in those things. Um, so you create sort of a market in money. You create a need for people to have these new technologies, these new objects that have been set out there into the world under your authority so that they can pay tax and so that um, then you as a political leader can say, everybody who holds my coin is one of my subjects. And that's, as, I'm oversimplifying, but that is basically what happened. And we have lots of um, readings and other research that you can do to look into this. I did want to bring up one thing that I find personally fascinating about this period in history. We have folks who are primarily living in a world of transactional record keeping without what we would call money. Right? This is the money. The money is the kind of accounting work that's, being, that's taking place in these, in these documents, if you will. But then political authorities start issuing coin and start saying, we want you to pay tax in coin. And a market in that coin grows up. People start using it for things. But people still have this mentality of record keeping and keeping track of, of transactions with each other. Here's what they do. This, in my hand, is an ancient coin um, from Lydia. This is um, one of the first coins printed, minted in the world. Um, we'll get you a close-up so you can see some of the detail. This is from um, the Persian Empire as it went into Anatolia, what's now the country of Turkey, um, in Lydia, which is sort of in the, the western part of, of the peninsula there. And on the front, you'll be able to see this in the close-up, there's an image of the king. Right? And again, this is just saying, this is the token of the king. You will pay your tax in this token. And by this token, I am asserting my political sovereignty over you. But as this thing started to circulate among people who were still used to thinking in terms of transactional records, well, what they did was they started putting all over these coins their own marks. And you can see on the back of this coin, and you'll see a close up in a bit, all of these little tiny marks that people would make on these coins. They were writing on the coin, essentially to say, I had this coin, and now I'm giving it to Don, right? Or, and Don stamping it and saying, I had this coin, and now I'm giving it on to Luis. And I had this coin, now I'm giving it on to so-and-so, and on and on and on. To the point where some of these coins are absolutely covered with these marks, absolutely covered with writing, in the same way that these little tablets 
are covered with writing. So even at the very beginning of the world of coin, you have people asserting and affirming by writing all over these things that even though this looks like it's sort of money unto itself, it's still a unit of account. It's still the way that we are registering credits and debts with one another. Um, and for me as an anthropologist, that really speaks to um, how the origin of money makes us think not so much about money solving the problem of barter, but instead about money as a kind of reckoning, money as a kind of memory bank that we use to keep track of transactions with one another, um, and money as fundamentally um, a creature of the state. Thanks.